Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way. In the first century, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. So Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went with Mary, his betrothed, to be registered, and she was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. But the angel spoke and said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Pray. Amen. Hey, Merry Christmas. Uh, you know, I hope you are ready to celebrate Christmas. Uh, you know, you're, you're packed in here like sardines, and that's an awesome way to get ready for you, the, all the people coming to your house, right, and doing the gifts, because it's going to be tight there, too. I was looking at it going, we don't have enough seating. It's a good thing we have kids. They'll sit on the floor. So, uh, hey, is your shopping all done? Yeah, <laughs> you guys don't sound as committed to that as I thought you would. You know, it's like after 3 o'clock on Christmas Eve, right? And some of you are like, Thank God for Walgreens. CVS is open till late, so I'm good. All right, okay, let me ask you this. Are the presents all wrapped already? Okay, yeah. Some of you got to go home and wrap some gifts. That's all good. Kids, are you ready for Santa? Yeah. All right. Well, let me ask you this. Kids, did, did you make a list or did you just kind of provide subtle hints for Santa? You made a list. Okay, good. That's smart. Way. How, okay, adults, how many of you make a list for Christmas so that people can know what you want? Okay, some of you do. The rest of you are like subtle hint people? Okay, look, let me just, can I just say this on behalf of men? We do better with lists, okay? Because I, I fail at the whole subtle hint thing. A few years ago, I'm shopping, Christmas shopping with my wife, which means she's shopping and I'm following. And, uh, and she says, in effect, buy this for me for Christmas. Those were not the words she used, more like, oh, look at this, this is so nice, that would look so, and, and so me being brilliant, I go, okay, I got to come back and get that, and so the next day, I went back to the store and promptly bought the wrong thing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the whole, you know, gift thing is a challenge to me, I just confess that, and yet, strangely enough, I'm happily married for 33 years, and uh, I have uh, two daughters, and I have two grandkids now, so uh, i just telling you, I, the well, here, here's how I come to cope with this. I've got kind of a, a different favorite Christmas song that I want to share with you. It's not really on like the top 10 most classic Christmas list, but I think you might, might recognize it anyway. So here's my favorite Christmas song. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Uh, you know, uh, a lot of you guys are like, yeah, I like that one too. I think it's moving up my list. So uh, you can't always get what you want. And honestly, that's the problem. Because we want stuff. We, we've got lists, whether we speak them out loud or not. And, and truthfully, we've got you know, lists for God that we want. And, uh, and we, we want stuff, and we don't get it. And, and then we get frustrated, we get upset, we get angry, we get depressed. Uh, actually, we, we kind of emotionally start acting like my two-year-old grandson, Eli, because he is incredibly happy when he gets what he wants. You know, he wants more candy, and, and he's happy. He, he wants, uh, you know, to, to do the flip thing where he climbs up my, my legs, and then I flip him over. He, do that, he's happy. He, he wants to play with water. Great. I, I'm the one who introduced squirt guns to the family. So, uh, you know, he's happy until he doesn't get what he wants. On those rare, extremely rare occasions when Papa says no, things change. No, you can't have candy because dinner's about to start. No, uh, we're not going to flip you again. We flipped 150 times in the last 30 minutes and I need a rest. No, uh, can't play with water because it's 50 degrees outside. Uh, and in those moments, you would think that the world was coming to an end. 
Because you can't always get what you want. So what do you want? We want financial blessings. Well, okay, we don't, that's a nice way of saying more money, right? It sounds so much better to say financial blessings than just more money. But so often, that's what we think we want. More money. Or we want to be healthy or to be healed, or if not us, our loved ones to be healed. We want, uh, we want our marriage to be healthy and strong. We want our kids to do well. We want to be happy. We want there to be a reason for life. You can't always get what you want. But God always gives us what we need. The angel speaking to the shepherds. You just heard the story. Uh, Pastor Robert shared it with you. The angel said, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you this day is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The Jewish people were begging God for a Messiah. And God gave them a Messiah. But he wasn't the Messiah that they wanted. You see, they wanted a Messiah who was a military Messiah. They wanted a conquering king who would defeat the Romans and reestablish Israel as a free and powerful nation unto itself. God didn't give them what they wanted. God gave them what they needed. He gave us what we needed. He gave them and us a Savior. Jesus, God in the flesh, wrapped in human form as a baby, coming to deliver us. He gave us a Savior who would suffer and die for our sins so that we could be forgiven. He gave us a Savior who would set us free from sin and death and hell. He gave us a Savior who would give us life, abundant life in this world, eternal life in the world that is to come. And he made this gift available to everyone because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. You can't always get what you want. But God will give you what you need. So we want financial blessings. We want more money. And God gives us contentment. Whether we have a little or a lot, whether, whether we are rich or whether we're living in poverty, he gives us that ability to be content with what we have, thankful for the blessings in our lives. We want to be healed or to be healthy. You know, especially if we're sick or our loved ones are sick, we pray, God, give them healing. And sometimes God gives us that health. He gives us that healing for a little while because you can get better, but eventually you're going to get worse again. It's kind of how the life works. I don't know if you've noticed that. But instead, what God gives us is the strength to endure this world. He gives us his presence as we walk this journey. He, he gives us hope based on the promise of eternal life. Because here's how heaven is described in the Bible. There's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain. We want God to fix our spouse. I know, I didn't say it that way before, did I? Because we always go, I want a happy marriage. But what we really say is, God, would you please fix them so I'll like them more? <laughs> right? It's kind of what we mean when we say, God, I want a happy marriage. We want you to do something with them because they are messed up. <laughs> and God's not going to fix them. You know what God's going to do? God's going to teach you how to love and how to bless and how to encourage your spouse. He's going to teach you to be the husband or the wife that you were created to be. And that will transform your marriage. We want God to fix our kids, right? Praying for our kids. But the thing is, he's not going to fix your kids. He's going to help you to be the mom or dad that he wants you to be. To be loving and encouraging and practice discipline in their lives to help them to get ready to succeed as responsible, healthy adults. We want to be happy. And God gives us joy. Such a difference. Happiness is built on circumstances around you that you can't control. I really pray that tonight and tomorrow as you gather with family and friends that you will be happy. But I know that's not going to be universal. See, circumstances. You can't control other people. You can't control what's going on in the world. You can't control the economy. And a lot, so much of our happiness is situational dependent. But joy that God gives us 
nothing can take away. You see, the joy in our life grows the closer we get to Jesus. The more we love Jesus, the more we embrace the teachings of Jesus, the more his joy fills our life and begins to overflow. Because joy is is how we understand the truths of God, that God loves us, that God is with us, that God has prepared a place for us, and that nothing in this world can change those realities. In essence, we win. We want a reason for life. And God invites us into his eternal purpose of changing lives. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, much like you saw earlier in baptism, then God is wanting to use you to lead men and women, boys and girls, into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the whole reason Calvary exists, to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And God is saying, hey, I want you to experience this with me. I want you to join with me in this work. I want you to make a difference that lasts for all eternity. So you can't always get what you want. And you know what's funny is sometimes when we get what we think we want, it makes us miserable. It leaves us empty and unsatisfied, maybe even ruins our lives. We can't always get what we want, but God will give us what we need. And my prayer for you today is that you will stop longing after the wants and you will embrace that which God has given you that you need. You'll embrace his love and his forgiveness. You'll embrace the gift of a Savior given in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. A Savior who will transform your life, who will give you hope, and and who will forgive all your sins. Who will change your attitude and your perspective and give you purpose. But you have to receive the gift. You're the one who has to decide whether you're going to say yes. And if you're here and, and you've never really made that commitment to follow Jesus with your life, it's as easy as just saying, Jesus, I need you to change me. I, I'm committing to follow you. Or maybe you're here and, and you've already become a follower of Jesus, but you've just kind of been wandering away from him. Guess what? He's excited that you're here. He's excited that you come home. He wants to welcome you with open arms and change your life and fill you with that hope again. You can't always get what you want. God is offering you what you need. I pray that you leave here with it. Let's pray.